So welcome, John Suchet, Classic FM presenter all the way from London and author of Beethoven, The Man Revealed. It's wonderful to speak with you. I enjoyed your book so much. Oh, thank you, Kevin. Always a pleasure to speak to a fellow Beethoven enthusiast. <laughs> well, I think uh, our listeners are going to get their load of Beethoven today. So let's yep. start with what is the difference between Beethoven the Marble Bust and Beethoven the All Too Human? Yeah, very good question. Um, this Marble Bust, uh, Actually, I've no idea who did it or when it was done. Um, I used to live in a large block of flats, apartments in central London. Um, a family moved out. The head porter, the house manager there, knew I was a Beethoven fanatic, saw this in the apartment after they'd moved out, brought it to me and said, would you like this? I said, yes, please. I also have in this apartment where I now live, um, a life mask of him. Uh, which is a bronze reproduction done from the life mask of 1812 by Franz Klein, as you'll know. And it's very dark, which is why I haven't used it today. But it has laurel leaves around his head. Even this is a godlike creature. And if you look at any statue anywhere in the world of Beethoven, he looks like some kind of god. The famous statue in the Münsterplatz in Bonn, his hometown, has him striding like a colossus. Uh, larger than life with that determined. He was nothing like that. He was nothing like this. He was nothing like the life mask with the laurel leaves. He was around five foot four or five, a little man, stockily built. And I love the description of him that was given by the first woman that we know, the young lady to whom he proposed marriage, um, who sang in the choir in Bonn. She turned him down and her granddaughter or great granddaughter, I forget which, um, Alexander Thayer, the great, the first really great Beethoven biographer, went to Bonn and interviewed many people that had, know, that had known Beethoven or had ancestors who had known him. And he interviewed this granddaughter and said, why do you think your grandmother turned Beethoven down? And she said, oh, because he was ugly and half crazy. That may be a misquote, but it's come down through the generations of the family. There must be some truth in it. And I think that is a pretty accurate description of the man that you and I and millions of others revere. He may have written immortal music. He may be one of the greatest artists who ever lived, but he was a man and a difficult man. And he had a pot-marked face from childhood smallpox. His hair was flying everywhere. His clothes needed repair and didn't fit. He was gruff and impolite to people, not the godlike creature with laurel leaves around his forehead or the godlike creature of the statues everywhere or even this handsomely, handsome, nicely quiet chap. Not at all. So, sorry, I did answer your question, Kevin. He was nothing like this. <laughs> well, you brought up romance, too, being turned down. That wasn't the first time he was turned down. Well, I think it was the first time because he was 19 years of age. That's what I meant. The only time. Sorry. No, absolutely not. It was not the only time he was turned down. We know of at least two other definite proposals of marriage to Giulietta Guicciardi, uh, to whom he ultimately dedicated what we know as the Moonlight Sonata. He never knew that title. She never knew that title. And again, to Teresa Malfatti, uh, to whom he proposed marriage. They both turned him down, although interestingly enough, as you will well know, Julietta returned, we might well have returned his love because she went to her mother and said, look, my music teacher's proposed marriage to me. What do you think? I'm inclined to accept. She said, well, you need to ask your father. She went to her father who said, a deaf musician? Are you kidding? No way, no way. And he forbade it outright and she turned him down. And she went on to marry a mediocre musician and went to live in, in, in northern Italy. Um, but he wrote at that time, I think it was 1802, just when his deafness was becoming noticed. Um, and he wrote to his old school, uh, well, not school, his old boyhood friend back in Bonn. He was now in Vienna. And he said, please send me my baptismal certificate because there is a dear young lady who is in love with me. 
um, and it was Julietta. So it's possible that she would have accepted had her father allowed her to, but she turned him down. Theresa Marfati turned him down. Josephine Brunswick is an interesting case. It's a long story. Don't want to keep you here till midnight, but he, a, a, a set of, I think it's around 12 or 13 letters that he wrote to her pleading for a physical relationship. Those letters, Kevin, were discovered in 1949, 1949, in an attic somewhere in Europe. She turned him down. It wasn't a proposal of marriage, but she turned down the relationship. So we are left with the one crucial woman known as the immortal beloved, meine unsterbliche Geliebte, who returned his love according to this letter, but marriage was out of the question. As he himself said in the letter, if we cannot forever be entirely together, we must forever remain apart. Who was she? We still don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, besides his romantic inclinations, and I can't imagine Beethoven being married, can you? No, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, if his emotions had been stretched in a different direction to his music, would we have had the music? I doubt it. And you know, his great friend Ferdinand Reese, um, his young helper who came here to London and married an English girl, um, and Beethoven wrote to him saying, oh, you're so lucky, what I would give for a wife. I don't think he meant it because he knew, he knew where his emotions lay. And I think you're right, if, if he had married, maybe we wouldn't have had the music that we have. And besides romance, he wasn't a very healthy guy either. Absolutely not. Well, I've mentioned the smallpox that he contracted as a young man. Um, all his life, I'll come to the most important bit in a moment, but all his life, he suffered from bad digestion. His digestive system, uh, his bowels gave him no end of trouble. In fact, when he, the first public performance he gave in Vienna, uh, three years after arriving there as a young man in his early 20s to perform his first completed piano concerto, we know that he was up all night the night before with diarrhea. No beating about the bush, he had bad diarrhea. We know it from Franz Wegeler, the same boyhood friend he wrote that letter to, who was in Vienna at the time and a qualified doctor, and he said in his memoirs, Beethoven had terrible trouble that night, night before with his bowels. I gave him a thick white solution to walked out for the first time across the stage of the Burg Theater to perform his newly completed piano concerto. He was struggling, struggling to walk decently, probably sat down with some relief, and then of course blew them away with his performance. But all his life, today, I'm always, I'm always suspicious of post-diagnosis 200 years on, but possibly irritable bowel syndrome, possibly Crohn's disease has been mentioned, um, I, I'm, I'm not a doctor, but he definitely had digestive issues all his life, which he did not help with his chronic drinking. He eating, would eat at all times and no times. He would eat a double helping of food for lunch and then go without food for days. And his doctors used to say to him, for goodness sake, just three nice meals a day, Ludwig. But he took no notice. And I said chronic drinking, almost certainly cirrhosis of the liver was what killed him. Uh, we know he smoked a pipe with very strong tobacco, loved the local rough red wine. So he didn't help his digestive system, which plagued him all his life. And then, of course, there's his deafness. And that, again, apart as well as the identity of the immortal beloved, the other great mystery of Beethoven's life is what caused his deafness. And to this day, we still don't know for sure what caused it. But in, in my view, that is the one health issue from which he suffered that he genuinely had no control over. And in a way, if you're a musician and that's all you can possibly be, and you're losing the one sense that in you should be more acute than any other, as he himself put it in his Heiligenstadt Testament, wouldn't you overdrink? Wouldn't you eat at odd hours? So he didn't help himself. But that deafness, of course, was the overriding health condition that he just had no control over. And 60 bean coffee probably wasn't helpful yeah. either. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that came from Anton Schindler, who was his secretary in the final years, who was a very, 
you know, he destroyed uh, hundreds of conversation books. He invented, he, he made sure that his great hero's reputation was unsullied. If only he hadn't done that, we would know so much more about Beethoven the man. He, it was, who said he liked Beethoven liked to count out 60 coffee beans every morning for his coffee. It's probably true because you wouldn't make something like that up, would you? Yeah. So he probably liked his strong coffee as well, which again didn't help. If there was such a thing as time travel, I would like to invite you <laughs> have to bundle up in your heaviest tweeds to a performance yeah. at what is now the Theater on Derveen on December 22nd, 1808. 1808. <laughs> exactly the concert yeah. I'm talking about. Yes, yes. What a concert that was, Kevin. What a concert. I mean, it came at the end of a traumatic year for him. Remember that I think the autumn before, in 1807, he was offered a benefit concert in Vienna. Uh, now, a benefit concert was the holy grail for composers because you choose your own, you play your own music, you select the pieces to play, you also have to select the players of the orchestra, you even sell the tickets from them. A lot of work involved, but it was a great showpiece for your music. And he was offered a benefit concert, and then it was postponed until January. Then that was postponed again until March or April. It was postponed again. And in fact, it was in the summer of that year when he was absolutely fed up to the teeth that he went for one of his long walks in the Vienna woods and wrote the Pastoral Symphony, which is one of his most carefree works. Beethoven's always an enigma. And in the August of that year, when he was at his wit's end for the benefit concert, he received a visit from a very strange character who represented the King of Westphalia. King Jerome, who was Napoleon Bonaparte's youngest brother, Napoleon stuck him on the throne of a fictitious kingdom. He decided he wanted a bit of culture at his court. So he sent one of his men to Vienna to say to Beethoven, I offer you the job of Kapellmeister in Kassel, capital of Westphalia, name your salary, no commitments. And Beethoven was so fed up, he said, yeah, sounds like a good idea to me. Announced that he was leaving for Kassel. Lo and behold, he gets a firm date for the benefit concert. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> However, that date, 22nd of December, because Antonio Salieri, who was Capelmeister, was giving a concert that same night in another theater for the Musicians, Widows and Orphans Fund. He put word out to the musicians, orchestral musicians, you play for Beethoven on that night, you'll never play for me again. So it was a motley selection of musicians that turned up at the Theater and Devine, an unheated hall in the depths of December. Beethoven had programmed four hours of music. It was a disaster almost from the beginning. Um, there was um, one of his, not operatic, but one of his, his songs, um, a dramatic song, Ar Perfido, was performed by a young girl, Josephine Kilitschke, who messed it up and ran from the stage in tears. Um, however, for the first time, Symphony Number no. 5, for the first time, Symphony Number no. 6, for the first time, Piano Concerto Number no. 4, not to mention uh, an excerpt from his Mass in C, and as a final item, by which time the audience had really had enough. They wanted to go home. They were freezing. And Ignaz Seyfried, who was the orchestral leader, said to Beethoven, for God's sake, drop the final piece. Beethoven said, no, I must play my choral fantasia, which begins with a piano improvisation. Then in come the orchestra, then in come the choir, then in come the soloist. And Zafri said, well, look, for God's sake, let's drop the repeat of the second variation. Beethoven said, all right, we'll drop, we'll drop the repeat of the second variation. The orchestra remembered, he forgot. <laughs> so, as you know, it, it pulled slowly and more so off the rails entirely. He got up, stormed over to the wind section and blamed the clarinetist who threatened to walk out. The rest of the orchestra threatened to walk out with him. And on, the whole thing ended in a shambles. But as you know, the, the, the fifth and the sixth, fourth piano concerto, the choral fantasia, which by the way, as I said, starts with a, a piano improvisation. He hadn't prepared it 
before the concert, so we had to just improvise. They didn't know when to come in. So it was, it was, it, it was worth being at. The reason Beethoven could fill a concert hall in Vienna was because they never knew what he was going to do next. Oh, we'd better go along. He might knock the candles off the piano like he did last time. He might get up and shout at someone like he did, and he did. So it was always worth going along. But as you say, what a, if you and I could have been there, Kevin, oh. December the 22nd, 1808, most important concert, really, of his life. And yet, what a disaster most of it was. <laughs> <laughs> There's also the story of, of uh, Beethoven in Teplitz with Goethe. And I uh, don't know if that's apocryphal or not, but it's a great story. Yes, are you talking of the incident at Teplitz where where the emperor and the em yes, well, some of it, 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 I've heard very, several different versions. I've actually been there and seen where it happened. Um, Teplitz is a little spa town in northwest Bohemia, now in the northwest of the Czech Republic. I think it's Bad Teplitz today, and it's still a nice little spa town. And he arrived there after the love affair in Prague with the immortal beloved, but he met Goethe. Both admired, each admired the other enormously. But Goethe was very, he was a very cultured, aristocratic German from Weimar. And Beethoven, as we know, was rough and gruff and didn't dress properly and spoke with a bad accent and bad grammar. And the two men met a couple of times and Beethoven played for him. And in fact, uh, Goethe wrote home to his wife how incredible Beethoven is. I have never heard playing like it, but he is an utterly untamed personality. And they went for a walk together in Teplitz, in the park, which is behind the castle, there's a sort of castle come palace there, not a very big one because it's a fairly small town. Um, and I went into that park where the incident happened. What happened was, and it depends which account you believe, Either the Empress of Austria, who was there taking the waters, came out of a bathhouse with her retinue, or according to a painting of what happened, it was the Empress of their retinue with arch to the side. Almost certainly that's not true. I, my money is on the Empress and her retinue. They had taken the waters. They were coming out of the bathhouse on the other side of the park. Goethe said to Beethoven, look, it's Her Majesty, it's Her Imperial Majesty. We must go and pay our respects. Grab Beethoven and they hurried over to the park and Goethe, there's a wonderful painting of this moment. As the Empress passed, or as I say, the painting shows the Emperor and Empress, but as they pass, Goethe executes a huge deferential bow with his top hat like this in deference. Beethoven has put his hat on the top of his head folded his arms and walked on by. <laughs> and Goethe was deeply offended by this lack of respect for the Empress. And as I say, Goethe uh, wrote of Beethoven to his wife, he's an utterly untamed personality. Beethoven wrote to his publisher, Goethe fawns for court, not the man of the people. And he did not like that. And in fact, the two men did not get on. They parted. Beethoven continued to admire him and for several years later sent him more um, uh, settings of his poetry to music and sent the settings to Goethe, but never heard back from him. And on one occasion wrote to him and said, you're most illustrious, whatever. You still haven't acknowledged receipt of my setting of your great poem, so and so, so and so. Please let me know whether you are Not a word. He never heard from Goethe again. I think that rather hurt him. Hmm. Oh, and by the way, just to say, Kevin, in that park, there's a plaque in the pavement and a little uh, commemorative stone saying, on this point, Beethoven insulted the Empress by refusing to bow to her. <laughs> a plaque to an insult. Wonderful. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Yeah, he's some character, isn't he? At some point um, years ago, I went all through Vienna, and this was before the internet, to try to visit as many of Beethoven's apartments as I could to walk up the yeah. stairs. And yes. that's because he was the worst tenant in Vienna. Yes, yes, it's true. It's absolutely true. Um, the place you will have worked, walked up all those stairs of the Milka Bastai apartment, um, 
which in his day was just by the, the big city wall. Um, and his fat violinist friend Schubens, used to complain, I think there's something like 120 steps, and he'd get to the top and go, oh, Beethoven, all those steps. And it's still the same today. Um, and he spent more time as a tenant in that apartment than in any other of the, I think, around 32 addresses that he had in, in Vienna. Um, and on one occasion, um, he decided that he couldn't see the Hungarian plane because the wall was, of the living room was in the way. So he got a stonemason in and said, take that wall out, put a window in. <laughs> and other tenants complained to the landlord, Baron Pasqualati, and said, you see, what, why can't we do that? And Pasqualati said, oh, God, so, and said to Beethoven, please don't do that again. And Beethoven would practice at the piano in the middle of the night. He would pound on the keys. He would bang on the wall. So he was, he was thrown out of, 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 of more lodgings that, than he wasn't thrown out of, just because he was, as you say, an absolutely awful tenant. You wouldn't want him as a neighbor. Unless yeah, you knew who he was. <laughs> the, the dumping of water on his head from a big bowl that would run down through the floor to the yes. Top below. <laughs> yes. That, yeah. Yes. Yes. The, that, that happened actually when he was he, he was performing one of his piano sonatas. Uh, a child poured water over his head to calm him down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we could talk all day, and I would sure. love to. But I wanted yeah. to touch on the end of Beethoven because I reread your chapter about his final days. Yeah. For such a, uh, a man with such passion and such life and such fire, it was pretty much a gruesome few days for him at the end. Yes, yes it, it, was, it was not an easy end. Um, remember, in, in September 1826, he went with his nephew Karl to stay in Neixendorf. Uh, with his brother Johann, and Karl had just attempted suicide. He had shot himself in the head. Uh, he survived, but he was superficially wounded. But, you know, Beethoven's world came crashing in, the sheer scandal of that. And it was a very, he didn't, he disliked his brother Johann. Johann had earned quite a lot of money as a pharmacist, uh, mainly by cooperating with the invading French. Um, and uh, with his money, he bought this beautiful estate, which I've been to again in Gneixendorf, um, and he wrote a letter at one point to Ludwig and signed it from your brother Johann, landowner. And Beethoven wrote back and signed his letter from your brother Ludwig, brain owner. <laughs> so he didn't like Johann. So going to stay with Johann, who had now married his housekeeper, who had an illegitimate daughter. Beethoven had tried to stop the marriage, as he did with his other brother. His nephew had tried to commit suicide. And while he was there working on what would be his final compositions, um, he, was in the, he was in the terminal stages of almost certainly cirrhosis of the liver. Um, his stomach, abdomen had swollen enormously so that he had to wear a belt around his coat. His ankles had swollen so much that he couldn't get his feet into his boots. So he was in great pain and great discomfort. And yet his final complete work, the movement to the string quartet, and it's actually quite a light piece of music. That's Beethoven. But then, of course, there's that dreadful journey back to Vienna. Happened on the night, I think, of December the 1st, 1826. Um, he had a blistering row with his brother. He said, I've had enough. Carl and I, the nephew, were going back to Vienna. Get the, get the carriage. And Johann said, look, Ludwig, you know perfectly well the carriage is unavailable. It's having its wheel fixed. I've only got the open top milk cart. Get the carriage. So Johann got the open top milk cart, one of his servants, to drive them back to Vienna, and they had to stay in an inn overnight. And I think that night was December the 1st, 1826. And Beethoven was in a room on the first floor, freezing, freezing cold night. The shutters didn't fit on the window. And when he came down the next morning, the landlord took one look at him and shooed them off the premises as quickly as he could. The last thing he wanted was a corpse on his hand. Um, and by the time they arrived back in Vienna to Beethoven's apartment in the Schwarzspanier house, he was seriously, seriously ill. We took to his bed. Carl summoned a doctor who was unavailable. He summoned another doctor whom Beethoven had insulted a few years before. And he said, I'm very sorry, I'm unavailable too. 
Finally, a third doctor came to one look at him and knew he was, he was dealing with a dying patient who was a famous composer. Fortunately, he took care of him. He did look after him. Um, and in the following three months, his stomach had, abdomen had swollen to such an extent that he had to call in the surgeon from Vienna General Hospital to drain it three times of fluid. I mean, the first time the fluid gushed out over the floor um, and Beethoven said to the doctor, doctor, you are like Moses striking the rock. Um, and he was, every, it was clear to everyone now that his days were numbered. And the third time that, or I think it was the fourth time the doctor inserted the tube, there was really no, this was the beginning of March um, and he died on March the 26th. Um, and interestingly, his, the last piece of music, I mean, he was in great pain, Two interesting things, Kevin, um, which I, 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 I know you know, but he was asked on his deathbed, who, your, who is your favorite composer? And he said, Handel, Handel. As far as I know, that's the first and only time he ever said it. They were a bit shocked, but they sent him the complete works. And then he asked his publisher Schotts to send him some wine. And Schotts arranged for a case of wine to be delivered to him. And he actually said, alas, too late. Alas, zu spät. And those are said to be the last words he uttered. It's also said that he may have said, Comedia finita est, the comedy is finished. But I think, I prefer to think it was looking at the wine, alas, too late. And the last piece of music that he, the last musical notes he ever wrote were on his deathbed, very shortly before he died. And it's a little canon, only a few bars long, for Karl Holtz, who was a young musical helper who looked after him, Holtz being German for wood, so he would pun on him all the time. You're, you're a wooden man, blah, blah. And he wrote, um, the, the words in German translate as, everybody, uh, we all err, but each of us errs differently. Mm. And he set this to music. You'll note, I have a recording of it. It lasts for about 20 seconds. The irren allesamt nur jeder irret anders. We all err, uh, but we all err uh, differently. And they were the last words of music that he wrote. Where he got the words from, we don't know, but it's somehow appropriate, I think. But as you say, a very difficult, long, drawn out, painful ending. And after that, even though he alienated so many people during his lifetime, the streets were filled with people at his funeral. Yeah. Yes, it's true. Yes, it's true. 20,000 lined the streets. The coffin was brought down from the, I think it was the first floor of the Schwarz Schwarzschanier House, the house of the black robed Spaniards, which was a huge apartment block, which used to be occupied by Spaniards. One or two, despite worldwide protests, because it contained Beethoven's last apartment, but it was a huge, unsightly block. It had to come down. Um, and if you go to the Schwarz Spanish castle today, you'll see absolutely no sign of it left at all. Um, but his, he was laid out in his apartment. Um, they did the post-mortem, the, the autopsy, on his deathbed, which doctors today, when I mention that to them, they go, oh my God, because that's not, not a nice procedure to undertake. And in fact, they, 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 they cut across here, lift up of his tin can, and they reached inside and sawed out his auditory nerves to try to understand what had caused his deafness. Um, and they put the auditory nerves in a large jar of preserving fluid, which vanished. Um, and there's a very strong rumor, it came here to London and was on the, the windowsill of a room in University College London, just not far from here, um, which took a direct hit in the Blitz in the Second World War. Anyway, it's gone. But what is interesting, and in fact, you may know more about this than I do, um, when they saw the cross here, little fragments of skull flew onto the floor. And the following day, one of his great admirers came with his young son to clip a lock of hair from his great hero's head, as many did. And while he was doing it, the young son got bored, saw what looked like rough looking marbles on the floor, picked them up and put them in a bag. And we've got them. Well, when I say we've got them, someone in New, in New York has got them. And last time I checked, which is a few years ago now, they were subject of a court case, but they are, it's claimed, fragments of Beethoven's skull. Now, 
this is very, very important because you'll know a few years ago, a lock of his hair was analyzed for uh, DNA and all, all this kind of thing. And they established very high levels of blood, uh, of lead in his blood when he died, which is interesting, but not really significant because everybody did in those days. Kitchen utensils were lead, paint was lead, blah, blah, blah. Um, and won't have had an effect on his deafness or his health really. But a lock of hair without the follicles is a very poor conductor of DNA. Bone is a very good conductor. Now, as I say, I, I, I'm a member of the American Beethoven Society in San Jose, California, which I, I know, I'm sure you are too, and you'll know about. Um, Bill Meredith, William Meredith, their former director, I think he retired through Royal Health, wrote a huge piece about this. Many years ago, well, about 10 years ago now, those um, pieces of skull are the subject of a legal battle in New York for ownership. Once that is resolved, they will be DNA tested to match them with the lock of hair that we know did belong to Beethoven. Once that is done, if they are DNA tested and their bone is a good conductor of DNA, we might have some clue as to what caused his deafness. Mm. And I just hope I'm alive when that happens. But I've beaten around the bush. You're absolutely right. 20,000 people turned out on the streets of Vienna more than ever had. There were riots and everything. They were there to say goodbye to their greatest musical hero. And I think one of the reasons for that, Kevin, is that they'd failed to do it for Mozart, who was buried in a common grave with no ceremony whatsoever. And they thought, bloody hell, we've got another musical genius. We'd better get it right this time. <laughs> <laughs> you have taken your book, Beethoven, The Man Revealed, and turned it into a 52-part series on Classic FM. That is an ambitious project. <laughs> you, you, you know, Ken, you have, you're a fellow broadcaster. Right. You, the, you, only you will know the pain that has gone into this because you're absolutely right. And we're now in August, so we're nearly eight months through. But guess what? I've actually written all 52. And part 52, I finished two weeks ago. And I got up from the computer I'm looking into now. And I just shouted. They could hear me on the other side of the River Thames here in London. I was so relieved. My biggest relief was that he was born in episode one. He dies in episode 42. What am I going to do then for the last 10 episodes? <laughs> but the difficulty, as you will appreciate as a fellow broadcaster, telling the stories was easy. But selecting the right pieces of music, because we're a music station, not a speech station, selecting the right pieces of music, making them fit into an hour. Oh, did my head in, but we got there. And I must say, I'm getting nice reactions. You know, where I get a lot of reaction from America, definitely, um, but also Australia, because it goes out, it goes on air at nine o'clock in the evening, Saturday evenings, UK time. And a lot of listeners in Australia, it's morning, and they write to me to say, we listen to it in bed with a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, every, uh, I, the opportunity to delve that deeply into his life and to play music, I guarantee a lot of you never have heard before, like that final canon, the Iran Alas Amt, and Schuppenzig, his great violinist friend, who, as I said, was very fat and complained about those stairs. You know the little 30-second canon he wrote, Lob auf den Dicken, in praise of fatness? <laughs> Schuppenzig ist ein Lump. He's, he's a Everyone knows the, lump. Yes, that's right. Schuppenzig is a rope. Everyone knows the Fifth Symphony, but who knows that? You that's do, and I do, because we're anorak. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been an absolute joy pulling out pieces of music that most Beethoven enthusiasts have almost certainly never heard. All right, I'm going to ask you one final question. I'm going to put you on the spot. Oh. What's your favorite Beethoven piece? <laughs> yes, yes. Everyone yes. asks you. I, I imagine it would vary by day. <laughs> that's, that's, very, that's a very good answer. It would vary by day. But there are two pieces. I mean, I, I have been asked it before. And I have to confess, difficult though it is, impossible though it is, Two pieces, depending on my mood. The Eroica Symphony, Symphony Number no. Three, for me, 
is his finest orchestral work. There's something about it. I've only listened to it five million times. It still takes me by surprise. How did he do that? Oh my God. And by the end, whatever's going on in your life, you feel you can climb Mount Everest. Also, Piano Sonata, Opus 110. No name, Opus 110, the middle of the final set of three, in which, in my opinion, he tells us about his deafness and how he overcame it. You listen to that transition, he writes a very doleful melody and he puts Klagen der Gesang, he writes that in the manuscript, doleful song. And when he repeats it, he cuts it off, sounds a chord, repeats it nine times, louder each time, and then goes into this massive inverted double fugue, as if to say, that was my deafness and I over came it. So in quiet moments for me, when I just want to remember the man, the greatest musical artist who ever lived, it's Opus 110. When I want to be inspired, it's the Eroica Symphony. Any of the late string quartets, Opus 130, the Cavatina from 130, Fidelio, depending on my mood, obviously that has moments. Now, Kevin, my turn to ask you. <laughs> Well, what me, do you turn to? What Beethoven do you turn to? I'll tell you a story. And, yeah. uh, when my son was born in 1997, I wanted him as the first music he ever heard in his life to be Beethoven. And I oh, thought no. long and hard about what piece should I play for him. And I decided on the symphony number no. six, the pastoral symphony. Yeah. because it's so lyrical and so beautiful and would welcome him to the world with oh, the greatest composer's music who ever lived. So that's yes. my story as far as oh, that's, a piece, yeah. That's a lovely story, Kevin. I mean, the Pastoral Symphony, to me, it stands alone. It's the only orchestral piece he ever composed in which he tells us exactly mm -hmm. what he is depicting in music with a title, not just the pastoral, but each movement has a title. Um, and he once said, I think he once said, don't ask me what my music means, just bloody listen to it. That's the exception. And what an, what an amazing thing to do. And I met your son when he came to London. That's guys. true. That's true. And does, does he appreciate your gesture? He does indeed. And I might add one more thing. This is not yes. the first meeting between a Gordon and a Suchet, because your brother David presented my son Scott with his diploma when he graduated from the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art. <laughs> oh, my, yes, David. When, oh, that's incredible. So the Gordons and the Suchets. <laughs> that is amazing. That is amazing. Well, he's a, he's a, I met him. He's a lovely young lad, your, your son, Scott, lovely young lad. And it was a pleasure to meet him. And um, in fact, I'm, I spoke, I wish I'd known, I spoke to David on the phone a couple of days ago, I'll be seeing him again soon, and I'll mention that to him, because I remember the day he was offered a place at the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art, and we're going back a few years now, and right. my dad, our dad, who was a surgeon, said, no way, no way, you must go to university and get a degree, you'll never earn a living an act. And David said, Dad, I'm going and I'm going to be an actor. And look, and look what happened. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I remember when David went and I think he's now on the board of Lambda. Exactly. Um, right. And in, yeah, yeah. Well, that, oh, that's a lovely story. Lovely story, Kevin. Well, John, it was an absolute pleasure to talk with you. We could talk all day. We could. Once again, say John Suchet, the author of Beethoven, The Man Revealed, a terrific book. And thank oh, you again. Thank you, Kevin. It's an absolute pleasure to talk to you anytime, just to talk about Beethoven. As you say, we could, we could go on for hours. Wonderful subject, wonderful man, wonderful artist. And people like you and me, our lives are enriched by him. So thank you so much for the discussion. Wonderful. Boy. Super, Kevin. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you so much <laughs> for great. taking the time, John. And it's a pleasure to meet you. Well, and to you too, Kevin, fellow broadcasters, ab absolute joy. So thank you so much. And uh, when, when you, you're, you're, on, you're on air in a few years, in a few hours time, aren't you? Same as me. Uh, in three hours, yes.
and do you go into the studio at the moment with with covid and all that oh yeah in fact well, I'm we don't in there because they don't allow the rest of the staff in the station right yeah. right right well i since march i broadcast from my study here in my apartment in london it's bizarre i haven't been into the office for four months uh five months it's right. just ridiculous ridiculous but there we are because technically being over 70 i'm in the high risk category ah. purely on the basis of a number which is equally ridiculous so anyway what can you do yeah. <laughs> well right. again thank you very much and i hope we You're most welcome touch, because i really enjoyed this very much good well let's do that kevin great pleasure to speak to you and thank you so much thank you john okay kevin bye for now thank you thank you